it's absurd to to me that the government instead of going after the specific illicit actors decide to essentially um decide to essentially prosecute everyone for the illegal actions of a few essentially it's it's communal punishment here because mm-hmm. people who are some people some of them are i'm sure doing legitimately bad things um but they're saying that these few people who are using these tools now mean that everyone who uses these tools should be punished because for now yes you can continue using these privacy tools you just have to make sure that you let us know when you're using those privacy tools and you need to give us all the information about how we can trace the transactions back what services you use you know you keep using them don't worry about it we'll just collect all this information just in case just to make sure you're not a terrorist but obviously the the progression is now using these tools is illegal Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet, a trustless open source wallet that gives you the keys to your crypto. Invoice, donate, and trade your Monero with peace of mind, peace of cake. And by StealthyX, an instant exchange where privacy is a top concern. Go to StealthyX.io to instantly exchange between Monero and 450 plus assets without having to create an account or register and with no limits. Making StealthyX a simple way to purchase Monero with crypto anonymously. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your monero.com or cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Seth for Privacy, a privacy tech advocate and head of strategy and marketing for Foundation Devices. The two discuss Seth's Freedom Tech article on the extreme proposal FinCEN announced last week to extend the Patriot Act to include all cryptocurrency privacy tools. Doug and Seth break down FinCEN's proposed regulations, discussing the false justifications they cite the potential implications on the financial institution that will have to comply with these regulations, the impact on the users of crypto privacy tools, what privacy tools the regulations as written cover, including whether Monero is one of them, the suspected real reason why FinCEN and legislators are motivated to attack crypto privacy tools, and ultimately why Monero users and wider crypto privacy community should be optimistic and focused on opting out and building out a parallel economy outside of the state-controlled fiat system. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Seth. Good morning, man. Good morning, Doug. Thanks for having me on. It's uh, yeah, it's been a Cheers. while since I've been Cheers. on. I think. Cheers to you. Not the first sip of coffee, but close to the first sip. Close yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. Make sure uh, you get started a little bit. Early morning. I like these early morning ones, though. I like, you know, I, I don't initially like them when the alarm clock goes <laughs> off, but once I get going, it's it's like going to the gym, right? If you get to the gym in the morning, mm-hmm. it's like wow, great, great start to the day. So I mm-hmm. uh, appreciate you doing this, jumping on. I wanted to get you on as soon as possible, given the news that dropped with these proposed regulations. Everybody's out there, um, you know, uh, tweeting about it. Whether you're on one side or the other there's a lot of fear there's a lot of fud i know you're not a legal expert per se but you follow these things very closely you have a very good understanding of all this so um i I wanted to to get somebody on and you you had mentioned that you were writing up a nice blog post on this which i I guess you'll be releasing once we publish this video yeah yeah i think it'll be live by the time this goes live so 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 yeah maybe maybe we could go through that but uh first if you want to tell us you know, just a little bit what what you've been up to. Um, I know I know you're working on a lot of things right now. In the- yeah, yeah. So uh, I, as I would assume many of your listeners know, I, I did uh, start to work in the cryptocurrency space full time for a, a Bitcoin centric company about a year ago. Um, so that's been a a lot of my time and focus over the last year is trying to continue pushing Bitcoin privacy just in the broader ecosystem um, by trying to build out full. Um, try to build out more approachable, more useful tools for Bitcoin um, and for for really other freedom tech. Um, so 
we at Foundation are very specific. We're Bitcoin centric. So we, we view Bitcoin as one of the tools that we need for freedom, but not the only one and really the, the means to an end. Um, so that's been an absolute blast. And as part of that, I've been able to do a lot more research and writing in the space. Um, and that, that recently has expanded into a, a new project that essentially Foundation are the patrons for, but I'm, I'm running with called freedom.tech, uh, where the goal is really to have a single publication where you can come to learn everything you need to know about what technologies empower human freedom and enable human flourishing, how to use them, where to find them, um, getting into the, the legal aspects of governmental pushback against privacy tools, uh, really getting into a lot of a lot of topics all around this concept and this category of freedom tech, which really, if we like if we talk about freedom tech, Monero is a, a fantastic and clear fit and that and that will 100 percent be be part of the content on freedom.tech because I view it as an essential tool and one that that people need to understand, even if they choose to continue just using Bitcoin, even if they they never touch Monero, they need to understand what it brings to the table, what it's been built for, um, and really that it's been built for situations like what we're going to talk about today with the, the fence in proposals. So um, yeah, freedom.tech has, has been a blast to start building out. We just launched it a couple weeks ago and will be a, a good portion of my my time and focus moving forward. So just a huge thank you to, to Foundation for, for allowing me to do that giving me all the resources I need and letting me drive with it. Um, but it's something where I don't want to be the only person writing for it. Ultimately, long term, I will be rarely writing for it. And I'll just be helping others to be able to create their work, build out great articles, great guides, great resources, and then get them published on freedom.tech so we can use our network and, and our resources to help to amplify voices of people who are building freedom tech or who are learning about and teaching others to use freedom tech. So that's a broad Im invitation to anybody who wants to write about Monero topics. I would love people to, to jump in and, and contribute um, things about Monero or about other privacy tech, freedom tech that you want people to know about there. Yeah, ultimately, I mean, I, I was going to get to this at the end of the interview, I thought, but uh, I might as well say it now. Ultimately, I think, I think that's, no, no, I'm saying my, my point, but you're, you're, you're kind of bringing me to it. Uh, that that's how we win ultimately, right? Is by controlling uh, or helping to frame the or reframing the narrative, mm -hmm. right? We're let we're letting the the quote unquote enemy frame the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to reframe it, and the only way we could do that is if we're out there creating our own narrative. Um, it looks like you're doing a great job with that with that blog. That, uh, yesterday was the first time I read it because you sent me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm early review of the of this article and i was going through it and i was checking out the website very, very well done i could tell i could tell it was it was seth behind the whole thing uh super high quality mm -hmm. it's kind of like it was kind of like your the your blog that you're already doing right because mm -hmm. you're kind of already doing that anyway right you're out yeah. there talking about freedom tech but yeah. i love the way you formalized it now um and that that's really important it's it's subtle well that's really important that's going to get people bring people around this concept of freedom. People have mentioned the terms freedom tech, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. throwing it around. Uh, now you really formulized it. I think you given you gave some like uh, bullet points on what classifies freedom tech, right? Like, yeah. So, yeah. It's really, it's a, it's a new category. So like there are some people in the space using the term uh, like Matt Odell is the main one that comes to mind. Who's been, who's been kicking mm -hmm. around the term freedom tech for a while and driving it and, I think it's it's the best way to encapsulate all of the tools that we have at our disposal that actually help us as individuals instead of helping corporations, governments, et cetera. Um, and so I, I think it's it's really valuable that we're able to craft a, a compelling and a, a useful and easy to understand narrative around these things. Because when we talk about like FOSS, free and open source software, or we talk about um, privacy tools or these other terms that we have for for these things in the space, a lot of people just get turned off because they're like, why do I need privacy? Why do I need um, free and open source software? What does that mean? What does the free mean if I have to pay for this software? A lot of it is very confusing for people, um, but everybody wants freedom. Even people who have no idea what privacy is or why they should care or no idea what Monero is or the Tor network is, etc. They don't need to know. They, they do know that they need freedom. So if we can make compelling arguments as to why these technologies enable human freedom, we can help to bring this these freedom tech tools to the the masses in a way that I think we can't without a more compelling narrative. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to building it out and really defining it and helping people to better understand what it is and, and also working with um, a lot of fantastic people in this space to to get the word out on why freedom tech is important and, and what all of the 
the things that fall under that category are. Awesome, man. Awesome. Um, so yeah, let, let's let's jump into to the big news. So I, I, the, if you don't mind, I'm gonna the, the title of your blog, "The Patriot Act Comes to Cryptocurrency: Demystifying FinCEN's Proposal to Extend the Patriot Act to Include Cryptocurrency Privacy Tools." So what what was it all about? I mean, people, uh, this thing dropped. I think like last week. Um, it seemed to be uh, a, a direct attack on all privacy privacy tools related to cryptocurrency. It was mm-hmm. like extremely broadly written, uh, but as I'm sure you'll get into it too, it wasn't it, it wasn't a, an outright ban. It, was, it wasn't them coming out saying you know uh, we're we're now banning all all of these uh, quote unquote crypto mixers. Mm-hmm. It was more so we are categor putting them into this certain category and now saying because they fall into this category all exchanges uh in the u.s or the other i guess uh financial services companies now have to abide by the regulations that go along with um you know anybody that that's that's seen using these tools that falls into this category you now have to you have to have to comply by reporting that that they're using these tools but if you kind of get into get into the weeds with it a little bit what what your take is on all this yeah for sure i mean i think it's also important to lay the background a bit for where this is coming from um because it's not like the government just came out of left field and hit us with this crazy attack on privacy tools and cryptocurrency uh but it's it's been something that's it's been happening for years at this point i mean we've we saw that this started with uh, prosecution of centralized custodial Bitcoin mixers, which I think everybody understands those are problematic. They they have problems even outside of the the legal ramifications. Um, but that was the initial target of the U.S. government was these big Bitcoin mixers that are being used in, in dark net markets and used by scary people. They went after those first to set a, an initial precedent for how they can target privacy tools within the cryptocurrency space. Um, And after that, we saw them expand over the last year and a half um, to start to target non-custodial decentralized privacy tools via Tornado Cash. So Tornado Cash kind of became the the fall guy for the rest of the privacy tools in the cryptocurrency space. Um, It was a, a bit of a interesting target for the US government, but I think they saw that there was enough links between usage of tornado cash and boogeymen like North Korea that they were able to to make the kind of the social argument of bad people are using this tool so we have to shut it down um and what they initially did was they they sanctioned tornado cash uh, which essentially meant that US users couldn't use the tool but it was a way to to put fear into people's minds when they're using privacy tools to make them think like this can change overnight I should be wary about what I use um and then even further in August the U.S. government indicted uh, two of the co-founders of Tornado Cash and indicted them because some of the activity had happened in the U.S. One of them they directly sanctioned, one of them they arrested. Um, And so they've continued these stepping stones of prosecuting privacy tools. First, just the ones that I think everyone can agree are problematic, and then slowly increasing or maybe tightening the the noose around privacy tools. Um, So this comes after specifically the tornado cash indictment which is fascinating because it the tornado cash indictment made no sense based on the existing regulations if you look and i I presented about this at hcpp and i have another article on freedom.tech about this but if you look at the previous fence in guidance the indictment against tornado cash seems completely illegal and illogical it makes no sense at all um but if you look at this proposed fence in guidance suddenly what they're claiming does make sense. Um, from my understanding, they can't put this into effect and then use it to charge the yeah, 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 cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think that they're trying to do that, but I think that they'll try to use the Tornado Cash devs as, as an example and say, look, e- now the, the proposal makes this even stricter, so you really shouldn't be doing anything like what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's yeah, kind of be- the background of it. Right, and what's, what's terrifying about it is... With the tornado cash stuff, it effectively was a ban, right? It wasn't them c- pointing out tornado cash and saying, you know, these things are mixers, and if we see you use it, we want you to report that it's being used. Mm-hmm. That was a flat out ban, 
through through right i mean they effectively yeah, the, the sanctions it's illegal, it's illegal to use tornado cash mm -hmm. and now here they are defining all these things that they're saying are mixers tornado cash being one of them and a list mm -hmm. of others mm -hmm. they haven't yet said if you use those things they're they're outright illegal uh but we've already seen them do that with tornado cash and now they've created this whole uh category of things that fit yeah. alongside tornado cash and potentially Monero being one of them, if you read it, if you read it broadly enough. But before before we jump into that, maybe we should, you know, can kind of continue to go through exactly what it is. Yeah, um, yeah I can give kind of the the DR. Yeah. I know there was a lot of context, but I think it's it's helpful to understand kind of how we got here. Um, but the yeah, the the quick summary is essentially FinCEN, which is an agent of the the United States Department of Treasury are trying to use the Patriot Act, which for anybody who's familiar with that, came into effect after 9-11 and was essentially a way to give the government vast amounts of power, specifically for surveillance and control, uh, to theoretically prevent terrorism in the US. It's kind of the, the guise that it's put under, but overall it's it's been used for countless abuses over the years, um, a lot of which were exposed by Snowden. Uh, there's been tons of revelation about how they have abused the Patriot Act to uh, target and attack U.S. citizens specifically. Um, so what is happening here is essentially FinCEN is trying to say that when you're using any sort of privacy tool within cryptocurrency, and I'll kind of quickly explain the categories uh, next, but if you're using any of these privacy tools within cryptocurrencies, you essentially should be under the same suspicions as an actual terrorist or an actual dictator of a, a malicious nation state like North Korea. Um, and it's saying that anybody who uses these tools should be counted the same. And when they use them and then interact with any sort of centralized entity that's that's regulated, so an exchange, uh, any kind of service that is regulated and accepts cryptocurrency, it, there's a very broad coverage, but for most people, the, the biggest impact will be exchanges. Not not only now will your information be collected, just like the, the KYC AML insanity where you have to give over your ID and a selfie video and dance around in a circle while you're holding your passport. Not only that will be collected, but now that information along with detailed information about what privacy tool you used, when you used it, when it was detected, uh, your IP address, any kind of information that they can p possibly gather about your previous usage of cryptocurrency, specifically privacy tools, and who you are now has to be sent immediately to FinCEN within 30 days, but basically immediately. Um, so before it was just they collect your data and then law enforcement can go to an exchange and say, we're looking for this guy, does he use your exchange? But now it shifts from law enforcement having to go to exchanges to learn about individuals, which for better or worse was at least a, a better system where they had to have a warrant theoretically and had to make legitimate claims. But now when someone uses privacy tools, all of their data immediately gets sent to FinCEN and they go on a, a nice tidy list of users who use privacy tools. Um, so obviously that will have a massive chilling effect on privacy tool usage because people will be worried about using any any kind of coin join service or anything like that. But um, it's, a, it's a massive jump forward because now a bas basically immediate reporting will happen when you use privacy tools and then use a centralized exchange. They're 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 defining they're defining us as the enemy, right? They're yes. they're they're putting all of us, all of us freedom loving individuals, on a, uh, as you say, on a list, mm -hmm. right? On, on, tool on, users on, are essentially on naughty list now, right? Yes, right, right. <laughs> the uh, the the they're closing in the gap. It's it's not far, right? From essentially from that, which is which is terrifying because it's mm -hmm. like you you feel them corralling everybody into this now. And it's not much like, yeah, it's not much of a leap to go from that to now saying, all right, everybody now who's used these things are essentially considered considered domestic terrorists. Mm -hmm. um, what was so, yeah, what, what just to, to, to kind of make that clear, even more clear to anybody kind of listening into this. So, so the scenario is like somebody's using Coinbase, they send Bitcoin, you know, whatever, whatever. they send some Bitcoin back onto their Coinbase account because they want to maybe sell some of their Bitcoin that they had pulled off previously. Uh, but maybe after they pulled it off initially, um, maybe they sent it through some kind of uh, Bitcoin mixing device or maybe they swapped it into Monero and then swapped it back 
into Bitcoin on a instant exchange, whatever, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of different categories. We'll go into it. Mm -hmm. And then they send it back to Coinbase. And now because it was seen that they did something in an attempt to obfuscate, um, you know, that, uh, or to clear the trail or erase the trail of that, of, of that Bitcoin that they originally obtained they're they're, they're put on that list and action is taken. Right. And that's mm -hmm. that information sent to FinCEN. Right. Is that, that the, that's the actual real world scenario of what? Yeah. Yeah. People pretty much. And that's the, the start for sure. I, I do not envision this being the end of, of what they try to do, but yeah, the start is you, you use any kind of privacy tool and you send money into a regulated entity in the U.S., so it will start with being U.S. only, which is an important distinction. Um, and I think a lot of the discussion is very like is very U.S. centric because obviously this is the U.S. government doing it. Um, but the the financial regulations that the U.S. government puts into place are often used across the world as guidelines for like, oh, if the, the U.S. government does this, we'll just follow along and, and take their their regulation as gospel. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if this expands past that, but. Yeah, right now it would be the, the Coinbase user, the Kraken user, whatever exchange you're using, if you touch any privacy tool. But the, the crazy thing is, like, their definition's not even remotely limited to actual, like, mixers by the traditional definition. And they've essentially expanded the definition of mixing to be any attempt at all to gain privacy on-chain. Um, right now it doesn't seem to expand to things like the Tor network or VPNs, um, but it could be expanded to that because the language is so broad, but essentially right now it, it applies to actual privacy tools like Samurai wallet. It would apply to, uh, decentralized privacy tools in Bitcoin, like join market, join market or, uh, pay joins, um, which has been a big, a big and, and great push for pay join adoption recently because of the whole swap thing. So one of the categories, um, or do you want to do you want me to just quickly go through the categories and we can, yeah, I can kind of explain some some examples of each? Yeah, one. Let, let, let's let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So they they lay out six different categories for things that they consider to be mixers. Although they do make it clear that these are just examples and it's not an exhaustive list. So their language is crazy, crazy broad. Essentially, they they describe mixing as any kind of transaction that obfuscates the source, destination, or amount involved in one or more transactions, regardless of the type of protocol or service used. So there could not be broader language there. If there's any privacy gained in that transaction or set of transactions, uh, even if they view it as privacy and it's not actually privacy, that is counted as mixing. But they break it up into six categories. Uh, the first is pooling or aggregating cryptocurrency for multiple people. Uh, essentially, I see this being both custodial mixers like Helix, which is a big Bitcoin custodial mixer that was was prosecuted, but it also applies to Tornado Cash. So I think this one specifically would be targeting Tornado Cash and tools like it. Um, because even though I would disagree that you're pooling funds because you, you can never get the funds of anyone else in Tornado Cash, you only get your funds out, they would categorize it as that, and they, they do in the, in the document. Um, the second one is splitting cryptocurrency for transmittal and transmitting it through a series of independent transactions, which is a very vague and broad category. Um, I think essentially what they're saying is trying to break up funds into smaller pieces and then send them to try and hide the source of funds, even though that wouldn't really provide you any privacy on chain. It'd be pretty privy, pretty trivial to trace. Uh, but it's, a, it's another broad category. One of the biggest and craziest ones is the third category, which is using programmatic or algorithmic code to coordinate, manage, or manipulate the structure of a transaction. Um, and this is the one that I think not only fits Bitcoin privacy tools, so things like Samurai Wallet, Wasabi, PayJoin, JoinMarket, essentially anything, because it's, it's just coordinating to change the structure of a transaction. Um, not only would it fit those, this is the one that I see fitting Monero. Um, because even though you don't coordinate with other users within Monero to build a transaction and gain privacy, um, you do use programmatic or algorithmic code to manage or manipulate the structure of a transaction because you build a transaction in a way that's intentionally privacy preserving. So obviously insane to consider Monero, and I think insane to consider Monero in the same boat as active, interactive, coordinated privacy tools like those on Bitcoin, but this is where I, I think that 
they would see Monero fitting in. Um, do, do you think they're actually kind of like, w- was it Monero that they're going after as they write that up? Or was it was it kind of defining uh, more of a, tra- you know, more I of think, a... I think Bitcoin is the, the target for this specifically. Um, I think that they... I think the the one that more targets Monero is the one that's uh, exchanging between types of cryptocurrencies or other digital assets, because a really common method of illicit actors, as far as we know, is to to steal funds like North Korean hacker steal funds, swap them from like Ethereum into Monero, and eventually swap back to Ethereum or, or Bitcoin and try to exchange those funds for, for fiat. So I think that's the main one that's targeting Monero. Um, but I think that because of how they've made the rules, it's pretty easy for them to slot it into the the third category as well. Um, but I do think that the focus right now is Bitcoin, but this will be very trivial to use for exchanges to to further justify not listing Monero. Um, and I think that will be a, a side effect that we see. Thankfully, obviously, we've been building out things in the Monero community that help to limit the impact of exchanges delisting us because we've been dealing with exchange to listings or not getting listed since, I don't know, uh, long before I was in Monero. Um, but that, that definitely is something where I, I do see Monero fitting in in that category. Yeah, because this part where they say uh, this method involves the use of software that coordinates two or more persons transacting, uh, two or more persons transactions together in order to obfuscate the individual unique transactions by providing multiple potential outputs from a coordinated input decreasing the probability of determining both intended persons for each unique transaction yeah what, what do you think that that that's referring by providing multiple potential outputs from a coordinated input what do you what do you think that part is uh referring to exactly i don't know so not to like really no no, no you're good. yeah I, I i do think that that one specifically is talking about Bitcoin coin joins. I mean, that, that sounds like Bitcoin an explicit coin description of, of mm-hmm. coin joins within Bitcoin. Um, right. And that being the biggest way to reclaim privacy in Bitcoin mm-hmm. makes sense. I mean, they're, they're going to go after the, the bigger dogs first um, as part of this. So that one I definitely think would, would be explicitly targeting coin join tools, but the language is so broad that I, I just don't know how it wouldn't also be easy to apply to Monero. But like I said, I, I don't think that they're targeting Monero right now mm-hmm. outside of the exchanging between Bitcoin and Monero um, aspect of things. And, and really, I think right there, they're targeting decentralized exchanges and instant exchangers because those are the, the commonly used tools for that mm-hmm. uh, in their eyes. And obviously, a centralized exchange swapping between the two doesn't actually provide any privacy. Um, and they give some exceptions for centralized exchanges that are regulated. As long as they keep logs, they can allow people to swap between those things. Um, but yeah, f- yeah. for me, the broadest part is before they even go through, say the such as and give the whatever it is, six, six examples. They say the term CVC mixing means the facilitation of CVC transactions in a manner that obfuscates the source, destination, or amount involved in one or more transactions, regardless of the type of protocol or service used. That sounds like Monero. I mean, literally when we describe Monero, right? We, we talk about obfuscating the sender, obfuscating the receiver, obfuscating the amount. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they go so far to say regardless of protocol or service use. Yeah. So they said no matter what, pro- like, so they're literally saying it's, you know, it could be any protocol that you're using, whether it's Bitcoin or something else. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think people are reading too much into the the such as, and then the six categories. They're useful because they give us an idea of what the government is targeting, but yes, they're, it's just such as, it's not these specific examples. It's such as, these are just ways for you to visualize what we're going to attack. Right. And And it's even if you, it's that term before the such as, it's that phrase before the such as that's the the catch all. Yeah. And if you go uh, a little bit before that as well, they describe CBC mixer. So Mm. they, they break it down into like the tool that actually does the mixing, which is called a mixer and the mixing itself. And you just described the mixing, but if you look at how they describe a mixer, it's any person, group, service, code, tool, or function that facilitates mixing. So again, that would be Monero. And and they hilariously even say, FinCEN acknowledges this definition is relatively broad. However, given the nature of mixing, FinCEN deems the breadth of this definition to be necessary. So they know how ludicrously broad these definitions are. 
and they're essentially saying it doesn't matter because terrorists they just <laughs> make it as broad as they possibly can and somehow think that this is going to get through obviously i would hope that this wouldn't but their their definitions are insane and i don't think we can really rule out anything if it relates to privacy and cryptocurrency at all being ruled out here with the the way that they've defined things that's the other crazy thing too i mean uh mixing isn't isn't in, inherently illegal right yes. it has to be that you're doing something illegal and using mixing to obfuscate what you're doing mm -hmm. um there's nothing, and I know I think we had Tor Erklin uh, mm. come out and say that there's there's case law that basically says that you know uh, in the eyes of the law it's it's not illegal per se to to mix your funds yeah. for purposes of uh, obtaining privacy. It has to be that you're doing it because you're trying to hide a crime that you committed. Yeah, very much so. There's is good precedent that supports choosing to have privacy not being an illegal act and and it's it's absurd to to me that the government instead of going after the specific illicit actors decide to essentially um decide to essentially prosecute everyone for the illegal actions of a few essentially it's it's communal punishment here because mm -hmm. people who are some people some of them are i'm sure doing legitimately bad things um but they're saying that these few people who are using these tools now mean that everyone who uses these tools should be punished because for now yes you can continue using these privacy tools you just have to make sure that you let us know when you're using those privacy tools and you need to give us all the information about how we can trace the transactions back what services you use you know you keep using them don't worry about it We'll just collect all this information just in case, just to make sure you're not a terrorist. But obviously, the the progression is now using these tools is illegal. We already saw that with Tornado Cash. I don't, I don't, I don't see a world in which that doesn't happen here. And the interesting thing is, it's really easy for them to sanction something like Tornado Cash because they're technically going after non-U.S. citizens, and so they can do that essentially with no barriers. They can just make unilateral sanctions and move forward people can sue them and try to push back afterwards which has been happening with the tornado cash case uh, and unfortunately failed at, at least in the biggest uh case of uh, them suing the um treasury but or the doj but in this case they're starting to go after how can we prevent this for u.s citizens unilaterally and that becomes a lot trickier in the u.s but you can see that they they started with the easy thing we can prevent these things for U.S. citizens and have a chilling effect. Or, sorry, we can prevent these things for non-U.S. citizens and have a chilling effect. And now they're shifting to the, using the Treasury to start to, to eat away at the access that U.S. citizens have here. Um, and again, this is very U.S.-centric, but I, I wouldn't hesitate to, to say that this will expand to, to other countries, especially those that are closely aligned with the U.S. financial system quite quickly. So it's it's slowly again slowly tightening the news slowly kind of building a a gilded cage where you can continue to use these tools as long as you comply provide all your information provide your kyc aml uh and you can continue to exist in the regular economy as long as you do everything the the right way and it's it's going to split cryptocurrency into white market and black market money i think there's just not a a way around that at this point yeah, you, yeah, it's now it's now that you're you're essentially guilty until proven innocent. Mm -hmm. You're on this list where you're assumed to be guilty because you use this, this tool, uh, and you you may have to come forward and prove your innocence if we call upon you to do so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially, is what it is, right? Yeah, yeah, very much so. It's a it's a continued shift from what the judicial system is supposed to be, which is innocent until proven right. guilty to the government continuing to shift more and more and more to guilty until proven innocent. Collect all the data, name and shame, list, make lists of people who are doing things that we don't like and lump them in with people who are legitimately doing bad things. And then, yeah, you'll have to prove your innocence. Part of that is submitting all of this info if you want to use any centralized entity to prove that you're not a bad guy. Um, but that really is guilty until proven innocent, which is a a crazy and nightmarish shift from where we're supposed to be in the U.S., um, where we have traditionally been and where technically we still are, but technically doesn't seem to matter as much anymore when things like this are, are quickly ramping up.
Yeah, let's just be clear to make sure we covered it because you're going through the car. So th this thing covers everything essentially. Any any privacy, any privacy tool related to crypto is is covered by this. And and even covered. it's so broad, especially with the exchanges category, that it it would really apply to a lot of things that aren't privacy tools. Like I could easily see this applying to instant exchanges like Fix Float. Mm -hmm. This would 100% apply to Bisc where the majority of their volume is people going back and forth between Bitcoin and Monero, which counts as mixing now mm -hmm. for some reason, even though that actually provides very poor privacy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's absurd. It's much broader than just privacy tools, uh, which is the other strange part. It's really anything that they claim would provide obfuscation, um, but even in practice, we know does not provide good privacy, uh, which is, is pretty nuts, but that's these <laughs> nice broad categories that include a lot of things. Um, yeah. So let's take a step back. Your 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 article, by the way, it fl flows a lot better than than this. Is just because I'm going all over the place and I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, it's very well written and and you go kind of in order. So first, you talk about um, what even you know. You talk about obviously what the proposal is, and then what are the justifications that they're that they're using for initially mm -hmm. making this proposal. Let's, so let's go back to that. How are they even? Um, what are they basing this in, right? To come out and and essentially suggest that they need to pass this this, this these new regulations, there needs to be some kind of justification there. They can't mm -hmm. just say privacy tools bad. They they must be there must be some evidence of the fact that these things are horrible and causing a tremendous <laughs> amount of of new crime and terrorism that you wasn't already so. taking place. Because <laughs> yeah. I mean, for what they're doing, there must be some major justification here. So what is the justification? Yeah, you'd, you'd think there would be some major justification, but uh, going back to like Tornado Cash, other cases, they they don't seem to need much justification. If there's even a small portion of users who are termed illicit users by the U.S. government, they claim that that's enough to target these tools. I mean, in this specific one, it's very clear this proposal was in the works long before the, the conflict in the Middle East broke out. But it's also very clear that they quickly pivoted and are trying to take advantage of this conflict to to use it to get this proposal through. Um, because, I mean, the eternal boogeyman in the U.S. since 2001 is terrorists. So anytime they can leverage that term and try to use fear to to get people to go along with things that that they want to push, they try to use terrorism as part of that. Um, so they they focus on Hamas and on the, the conflict in the Middle East and claims that cryptocurrency is heavily being used to finance these terrorist organizations. Uh, weirdly enough, they provide no actual numbers for that, no amount of cryptocurrency that's flown to them, no proof of any usage by terrorist organizations for these tools. Um, throughout the proposal, essentially, they rely on chain analysis almost exclusively, uh, but with a, a little bit of elliptic, both of which are chain surveillance companies, to provide evidence for illicit users using privacy tools. Um, so they say that there's a, a an uptick in privacy tool usage by illicit actors and that they need to do something to, to prevent them from being able to use these tools. Um, but if you actually look through what they use to justify that claim, they essentially just say, look at the previous cases where we've prosecuted privacy tools. So they specifically mentioned two cases that I've written on before. One, which is Helix, which was a, a custodial Bitcoin mixer um, that was mostly used in, in darknet markets. And then the second is Tornado Cash. Uh, but if you look at both of those cases, uh, it's specifically in Helix, which is fascinating, they it's a centralized tool, custodial. As far as we know, there were logs of how the actual mixing happened because it was all centralized. They got full access to this guy's tools, to the logs, etc. The most that they could claim was illicit usage of this tool that was primarily advertised in darknet markets was 12% of usage being illicit. So even then a small fraction of the users of Helix, but they use that as justification for if bad guys used Helix, we now need to, to push further to prevent them from using other privacy tools. They also use Tornado Cash as an example, even though in Tornado Cash, despite Ethereum having abysmal privacy on both ends of going into or out of Tornado Cash, they only are able to attribute about 7% of usage of Tornado Cash to illicit users. Uh, but still, they tried to use that to claim that because bad people use Tornado Cash and we, we were prosecuting them or were able to prosecute and sanction them, 
And because bad people used Helix, it shows that bad people like privacy, which is obvious. Like it's it's the most <laughs> absurd claim ever. Like yes, they, they also like the internet and use that too. <laughs> yeah, criminals have loved privacy and every advantageous technology since the dawn of man. Like this this is how things work. People who have more of a pressing need, which often criminals are the ones in need of the the most advanced tooling, initially use the tools like that's there's nothing strange about this and this has always been true but that is essentially their justification um the the other main statistic that they use is a, a report from chain analysis over the last few years showing that the percentage of illicit usage in mixing tools has increased but and they they hesitate uh, to mention this and leave out chain analysis own assumptions or their own uh, findings about this statistic, even though in 2021, but or between 2021 and 2022, the actual usage of cryptocurrency privacy tools drastically decreased. So there was an overall decrease in the usage of privacy tools. The percentage of usage that was illicit did increase between 2021 and 2022. But you have to look at what happened in that time span. The, the primary or the biggest thing that happened was the US sanctioned Tornado Cash, which is a, a very heavily used privacy tool, specifically one of the main privacy tools that Chainalysis looks at in these analysis or analyses. So they sanction a tool and they put fear into the mind of every user of privacy tools. What do you think is going to happen? Right. Do you think the illicit actors are going to stop using these tools because the government says they shouldn't? They're already criminals. They're already doing things that would get them in jail. They're not going to stop. Who do you think is going to stop using these tools? Licit, legitimate actors, people who just want some privacy, but are who are worried now that the U.S. government is going to go after them. And even Chainalysis themselves, who have a financial incentive to say that criminals love privacy and they need the government needs to use their tools, et cetera, et cetera. Even Chainalysis says the data suggests that legitimate users have decreased their use of cryptocurrency mixers. So the main justification of the U.S. government is, look, more illicit actors are using privacy tools than ever. The percentage is increasing. And yet even their own cited source says this is because legitimate usage decreased due to U.S. government action. It's specifically a result of the, the government's activity. Um, so that's the, the core of their justification is bad people love privacy and more bad people are using privacy tools than ever, even though overall usage is going down and there are clear and uh, obvious reasons why the regular average Joe who just wants privacy is using privacy tools less due to the actions of the US government. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. Do you, like, are they aware? Are, are, are they cognizant of all this, or are they just making? Are they just making mistakes? It's got to be that the, that they're completely cognizant of it, right? And they're just they're just steadfast on trying to you know pull one over on everybody right? i think so and i mean that was like manipulating the narrative manipulating the data yeah because if they're not capable then they're just completely incapable people i mean which is even scarier right <laughs> I mean, you have to look at like who who do they need to convince of this this primarily they need to convince the public in a sense even though how many people are actually going to to reach out to Finson and comment on this which is is something that i hope people will do once the comment period is open but outside of that they have to convince the us government so i think we have to remain a little realistic about who they're trying to pull the the wool over their eyes it's less us like obviously we're going to push back on this but it's people who don't have a deeper understanding of what these tools are about how they can be used for good people who are using these things day to day to survive or to thrive. So it's, I think their target audience is different, which we have to remember, but I do think it's very much, they, they're cognizant of this. They know that that there are flaws in this reasoning and that it's overly broad. They even explicitly say, this is probably overly broad, but we don't care. Um, I, I just think they, they think that they can get this through no matter what, 
just yeah. like I think they think the indictment against Tornado Cash, even though it's it's blatantly absurd, they think they can get it through because they're able to scare people enough to just go along with what the government says to keep them safe. That's that's ultimately at the root of this is we start out by scaring you and then we outline how we as the U.S. government can protect you by stripping you of your privacy. That is the, the root of all of these steps is give us your privacy, we'll give you safety. And that, that ultimately is the, the trade that they're offering and have been offering for a long, long time. But really, since 9-11 and the Patriot Act has been the, the most drastic shift is trade your privacy and freedom for safety and security. Uh, and they, they think people will continue going along with that. Uh, I think that that narrative is shifting and people are waking up to the issues there. But that's, I think, their, their ultimate goal. Yeah, they're wa- they're waking up. I mean, there's there's me and you and a bunch of other you know uh, people that are out there using things like like Monero, but the masses are still just you know going going along with whatever whatever governments tell them, whatever mainstream media tells them, and that's that's the terrifying part. I mean, I think saw, it I think it's shifting. Saw with, we saw it with COVID though, right? It happened. We saw it with COVID the amount of. Everybody fell in line, went along. They didn't question things. Those that did question them were were, were called crazies. Uh, so here you are. You're gonna have, um, you know, headline is crypto is used for for financing terrorism, and now it's up to you to go explain to the masses. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Look at the data. No, no. Wait, wait. That's you know they already use the internet, and, you, and it's the burden of of proof is now on us to go out there and re-explain all these, all these things and explain, you know, basic concept like free speech and, and liberty. And, uh, it's really an uphill battle. And all they have to say is, you know, uh, crypto bad crypto is used for terrorism and they're, and they're, they're wrong. And even in saying that they, the data doesn't even there, but it's, it's too late. They've already said it, they put it out there. And then you have, you know, Congress people that are going to be out there citing the same stuff inaccurately. And it's just, how how do we beat that? You know, how do we? Uh, obviously, uh, me and you and uh, the people listening to the show are already on board. But how do we get out of our our silo into the? Because we have to get that message to the mainstream. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we live it. We live in a democracy, right? Where essentially uh, majority rule, um, and we we need to get that get that meme out there, spread it far and wide enough to where people go, wait, hold on a minute. I get what you're saying here, alleging that it's used for terrorism, but don't they also use the internet? We didn't, we didn't apply that standard to the internet. Why are we applying that to this? Like, but any thoughts on how, or even if we can do that, obviously, I mean, mean, I'm assuming you're optimistic about it, but. Yeah. I mean, I like to, I don't know. I don't know how to term my uh, my optimism. Maybe a pragmatic optimism, um, which I think is is kind of at the core of how Monero has been built out over the years as well. Um, just a realization that we're going to fight a battle over these things. Any tool that actually works and actually strips power from the government and gives it to the individual, there's going to be a battle. There's not this like hyper Bitcoinization dream where we just peacefully end up in this world where everyone has freedom, money, and everyone's free and happy. Governments aren't just going to go down without a fight. Um, so I think that we we should understand this, and I think many in the space have seen this type of thing coming for many years. Um, that's why Monero is built the way that it is. That's why Monero will continue to work beautifully despite the government's attempts to to shut it down. But I, th- I think the the optimistic side is if the government is spending this much time and effort to push back on privacy tools within cryptocurrency. It means that the tools are working, and it means that we're actually winning right now. The government would not take overt action against these tools if they were only used by a tiny minority, if they were not providing any freedom from governments. They would not take the the risks, because ultimately this is a risk for them. It puts the, the public eye on the concept of the government being able to dictate what you can and cannot do with your finances. Um, I don't think they would take this risk if they weren't worried right now. And that's a, a good thing for governments to be worried about what their citizens are able to do to, to push back against them. It's something that we desperately need to be able to keep any semblance of balance um, in, in countries that, that claim democracy. So I think that's le- like the initial thing that I would say is just don't view it only as doom and gloom, but also view it as an optimistic, we are actually doing things right in some sense because the government is, is scared and pushing back on this. 
I mean, the biggest thing for how we can push back on this specific proposal is really getting the word out there. Like the the thing that has to change here is public sentiment. If the government knows that the majority of U.S. citizens do not align with their view that if terrorists use technology, the technology should be shut down or heavily surveilled. I, I don't think anyone really agrees with that. And like you mentioned, if you use the, the, tech, the example of the internet or iPhones or whatever you want to mention, all of your favorite technology is used by terrorists. Sorry, people. They're, they're people. They, they use the same kind of tools you do, and they, they use things that provide them privacy and freedom because they unfortunately choose to use their freedom to harm other people. But if they do that, it doesn't mean that the tool should be shut down, and it doesn't mean that the tool isn't providing an outsized amount of freedom to other people, to regular average Joe people who need that privacy, need that freedom. So ultimately, the I think the best thing that each of us can do is we, we have a a sphere of influence, if you will. We have people who trust us, who listen to us, who we can talk to about these kinds of topics. That may be just friends and family. That may be a, a huge social media circle. It it depends on who you are and who you're, what uh, like what you do, what your influence in the space is. But the more people that we can wake up to the the pressure the U.S. government is putting on tools that provide human freedom the better off we are. So I think that's the the biggest step that people can take is if you see good content about this, if you listen to this podcast and you think that it's helpful to explain what the government is trying to do, share it broadly. That's going to be the best way that we we fix this is we make people aware of what's going on and how absurd the government's claims here are. Um, the last piece I think is, is the one that's the maybe the lowest impact, but kind of has to be done anyways, which is there's a there's a comment period of 90 days around this Vincent proposal. Um, the, the period isn't open yet as of recording right now, but it, it should be open soon. I'm not really sure what the date will be. And you can leave comments with Vincent to tell them why this proposal is incorrect. You can spe call out specific things, target one thing, target everything. The goal is to give Vincent comments that show them this is absurd, it's problematic. You should revise this and, and take this back to the drawing board. Um, ultimately, just like bashing the government in those comments is probably not going to be effective. Mm. But I, I have heard from people like at Coin Center who do this for a living that Finson does actually read these comments. So if we can leave constructive and insightful comments that lay out the issues with this proposal, we can at least do the little that we have the power to do in this kind of a situation. We don't have the ability to directly vote on this proposal or anything like this. If Vincent wants to ignore all the comments, they 100% can. But I think it's it's one of those things where we, we do have a duty as U.S. citizens to try and use any means at our disposal. So I, I would recommend that once there's uh, an actual open comment period. I also know some people who are building out a tool to, to greatly simplify the process of creating your comment, um, actually using AI to help you write it. Uh, in a way that's that's useful and, and legible. Um, so once that's live as well, uh, I'll, I'll be sharing that for my account and maybe you can throw that in the show notes once it's live. Um, but there are going to be some tools that help to simplify that. But I think that's a step that we should take. If you're a US, U.S. citizen and you don't like this, I think we should leave insightful and useful comments for the government to let them know where we stand and how absurd this is and that many of us do realize how bad this is and how, how much they're overreaching. Well, we, we have Congressman uh, Tom Emmer, who's right a real real pro crypto guy. He even he doesn't really. I don't think he's ever mentioned Monero. He might have mentioned it in an interview, um, but he talks about the importance of cash and digital mm -hmm. cash. Mm -hmm. And he might become the next Speaker of the House. I don't know if you've been following that. No, close. I haven't. Um, he's like kind of the next guy up. They haven't been able to figure out who the Speaker is going to be. <laughs> Um, so, but he's about to potentially lock in support. So that's maybe silver, you know, that might be some glimmer of hope there. Yeah. Uh, Tom Emmer becomes speaker of the house. We have somebody out there who, who supports, uh, these concepts of cash and digital cash, mm -hmm. but that's ultimately is what needs to happen, right? We need these, these large political voices. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm a cypherpunk first, trust me. Cause I've, I've experienced <laughs> it myself. This is why I'm out here doing this. Cause I know this is the most productive way, right? The uh, opt out of this uh, opt out of dystopia and opt into Monero topia, use your Monero, you know, ignore all this bullshit, build so our own productive for the individual but yes. often not for the whole, which is, I think, where we, I think we do bear some responsibility to try and help 
others even right. though like i'm a i am a cypherpunk too i mean i have a that's a giant poster in the background that talks about how important being a cypherpunk is but we do also bear this responsibility i think when we understand the issues here to do what we can to help others so i, I didn't want to interrupt you but it's yeah, just kind no, of right. my view on it and why i think there's other value and i know you do too because you've you've yeah. run for a public office before like you see yeah. the benefits of that like why not why not try right i, yeah. I understand it. it's you know the odds are against us um but why not try because at the end of the day we don't we rely live- on it Right. We live here. We live here in this country, we live in the U.S. You could opt out. You could try to be you know, we're trying to create our own island, uh, but we're all, we're surrounded by this 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 much larger, larger uh, nation that we're that we're in. So mm-hmm. we might as well try to, to shift things. So I think that's encouraging. Like next presidential Republican presidential debate, like that would be tremendous if we could like get that, get that to be one of the questions, oh, right? Well, what, what, is, what is your take on, on these, you know, should, should these technologies be banned because they're uh, quote unquote used by terrorists? I would love mm-hmm. to hear their answer. And that would reveal so much on where they actually stand in terms of yeah. uh, individual liberties and things like free speech that would reveal it all. Right. It puts all the cards on the table. Like uh, what where do you stand on this? But I think the the biggest issue is with, with crypto compared to, let's say, like the iPhone. Right. If you go around and say, hey, look, the, the government wants to get rid of everybody's iPhones because the terrorists can use these things to really easily coordinate and, and c- commit terrorism. Everybody like, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I use my iPhone every day. I, I rely on my iPhone. I'm not standing for that. But if you go around to the average Joe and say, uh, you know, they want to they want to ban privacy coins, they want to ban things like Monero and mixers because they're used by terrorism, you know, potentially used by terrorists. People be like, all right, I mean, I don't really use that that anyway. And, and, and more so, they'll be like, well, what is what's what does it do? What's the utility? What positive things does it do that mm-hmm. a lot of people just don't grasp because it's slightly abstract. They don't grasp the utility. It's much easier to grasp the utility of an iPhone, grasp the utility of the Internet, but to grasp the utility of digital cash unfortunately isn't that isn't that easy for the average joe that's the real yeah. problem in my mind especially in the not, us they're not seeing understanding the utility and the utility is tremendous given the direction of of you know of where we're headed with the world and uh the the amount of, of growing uh technocracy around the world uh that traditional cash is no longer going to exist we're going to need some way to communicate value peer to peer on the internet without censorship blah 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 eyes glazing over if you're a normie like they just don't see the utility there mm-hmm. what i mean any thoughts there on how or is, or is it just we just it's, have to work among ourselves and slowly grow our, our camp yeah it's i think it's especially hard in the u.s because people have this assumption that if I have been free to use my money how I will historically, that will continue. People get stuck in this kind of status quo mindset and don't understand how quickly these things can change. It's a lot easier to talk about these things in like uh, countries that were part of the the USSR or countries that have had dictators or countries that have had hyperinflation. It's a lot easier and more possible to actually get across this point of how useful these things are because the people, they have actually needed tools like this. It's hard in the US because most people have not realized the need for tools like this. And we're at this point now where I think very soon we will have a desperate need for tools like this, but we don't quite yet. And you can get by using the the regular everyday tools right now and retain most of your freedom. So it's I don't know, it's a very hard pitch right now. And I think there's a reason that the government is ramping up their efforts here around preventing the usage and preventing the like above board white market usage of cryptocurrencies, specifically if they preserve privacy. Because with the advent of CBDCs, I, th- I think that a lot of people are going to wake up to how dangerous these things are. So I think what the government wants to do is make it very clear that cryptocurrencies are bad, you shouldn't use them, terrorists use them, blah, 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 and then make it as hard as possible to use privacy tools or privacy coins specifically, because those are the things that provide the most freedom. And to get all of that in place and done before they launch any sort of CBDC, so that once they do launch it, it's already much harder to get into 
cryptocurrencies like Monero, it's much harder to use them. There's not as many places to use them to pay for things. It's, a, I think, a stepping stone towards that. But it's it's really hard in the meantime to convince people. I mean, honestly, I think in the U.S. It, we're kind of in that situation where people have to get burned or they have to know someone who gets burned. We can do a lot to educate on these tools and how useful they can be. Uh, that's part of why, like, for, for freedom.tech, I want to write stories about how people are actually using these things in real life. That will be a focus is what freedom are these tools actually providing? Oftentimes it's hypothetical. It's when this happens, you'll need a tool. When this happens, you'll need a tool. But we need to tell the stories about how people are actually getting freedom through these things today so that people can understand that that could happen in my country. I need to know how these tools work. I need to get some of this right now before it's too late. And I think a lot of that comes down to telling human stories around freedom tech rather than just talking about how useful the technology could be in some some theoretical future. Yeah, I think another thing too is right. So we got we got to reframe the narrative in terms of talking about uh, all the utility that digital cash actually provides, right? Mm -hmm. and, and make that the battleground. It shouldn't be whether or not some percentage of, of of Monero transactions are used by 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 terrorists. That shouldn't even be the the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't even be talking about whether it's ten percent or fifty percent. It should be this stuff offers you universal utility for the world uh and this is why it's important it's free speech money that's in code and and, and then talk about all the reasons why that's that's essential to open and free societies and yes terrorists are going to use it too everybody's going to use it that's the whole point everybody can use it uh so reframing that but i think the other the other thing we could potentially attack them on and change the narrative on is the whole charade that's happening here with these regulations and what's really happening behind the scenes. It's not uh, just a bunch of patriots that are out there looking out for our best interests. It's a completely corrupt apparatus, right? Mm -hmm. That's being driven by money and power mm -hmm. and their influence to pass these regulations, not because they're, they care about terrorism or they're looking out for average average Joe, and they care about uh, you know the United States of America, and they're and they're gently weighing against their individual liberties. No, they they've thrown that all out the window. They want to pass this, these regulations because they stand to benefit by either you know gaining more power or enriching those that end up getting enriched when, once these regulations get passed. So, if you want to talk about a little bit about that, we've I think Arctic Mine was kind of the first to really open up my eyes to this but how we think the you know the ecosystem might really be working in terms of how these why what the incentive is for creating these regulations in the first place and who's ultimately benefiting companies like chain analysis and things like that yeah yeah i think there's there's two main sides here one is that obviously the us government can increase their power and increase their control if there are less ways to opt out of what they dictate to be legal approved financial action. It's a lot easier for them to control fiat, specifically once they have some sort of CBDC in place, than it is for them to control decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Monero. Um, so I think that's the, the obvious one, and I think that's the one that will be clear to most people here, that the government stands to gain by preventing us from having access to tools that actually provide us privacy from the government. Mm -hmm. And there's this concept that they're putting forth that anyone who wants privacy from the government is a criminal, which is Again, patently absurd and a, a massive overreach, but that's what they're trying to make clear, is if you want privacy from us, you must be a criminal and you need to prove that you're not before you can continue to exist in our economy. And that, that is ultimately the world that the government wants, where they have 100% visibility into everything that we do, and specifically into how we use our finances, because if you have visibility into finances, you don't really need much other surveillance because the way, the way uh, where people spend their money, et cetera, gives you almost a holistic picture into who someone is and what they do. So I think that's the, the clearer part that most people see. The more shadowy part that most people don't understand is the companies like Chainalysis that essentially exist because they create a, a symbiotic relationship with the government. Exactly. They exist because the government needs some outside party to justify their claims about these things. They need someone to be able to put some science, major quotes there, if you're listening, 
behind their claims that these this person is guilty because we can prove on chain that something happened, even though in like the case of Roman Sterling, all there are a lot of reasons to think that Chanalysis is completely just making things up and has no clear science upon anything that they're doing. There's a ton of good articles by somebody in the, the Bitcoin space called Lola Leets that mm. she's kind of broken down a lot of the insanity that's going on in this case where Chainalysis is trying to convict this person essentially on their word alone and yet won't reveal anything about how their tool actually works to the court or to anyone outside of the U.S. government. But there's, there's this symbiotic relationship between the government who obviously wants to increase their power. They have clear incentives to do that. And then Chainalysis, who have clear incentives to tell the government, bad people use these tools, so you need our services to figure out who the bad people are and to expand your power. And then as Chainalysis is able to get the government to expand their rules, like with this Finson proposal, guess who stands to make obscene amounts of wealth? Chainalysis. When this proposal goes live, if this goes through, suddenly every entity in the U.S. <clears throat> that interacts with cryptocurrency and is a... a business that operates in kind of the, the normal white market economy suddenly now has to collect an absurd amount of data. They need to monitor every single incoming transaction <clears throat> to see, is this person using a privacy preserving service? If so, collect that data. And I also need tools to be able to send this data to FinCEN. So who knows, maybe chain analysis will make a nice tidy tool that you just press a button, it investigates your customer and it just ships that data right off to FinCEN for you. The people who stand to gain the most as far as financial incentives are chain analysis. They, they can build this feedback loop with the government, whereas they tell the government bad people use cryptocurrency. The government says, OK, show us. We'll put it regulation in place. The government puts regulation in place. Chain analysis is the one that's used right. by all of these entities that are now forced by the U.S. government to perform chain surveillance. And it, it builds this crazy cycle. And there are other chain surveillance companies as well that stand to benefit Primarily, it seems Chainalysis uh, is the the main driver behind this for the U.S. government. Uh, they're by far the most commonly cited one in this specific proposal. Elliptic does have a few mentions as well, um, but that whole surveillance apparatus it's it's a it's a black box, and the only people who stand to benefit from it are the government and these chain surveillance companies. Yeah, the, the, these are the people we need to put on a list, right? And <laughs> these are the people who who we need filing reports. I want to see where that money is going, right? That that ends up uh, going somehow getting donated to, to Senator uh, Warren, right? In some way or another, like that, that, that is how it, that, that's how it all works. Like another example, like R, RFK uh, Jr. should be out there talking about this. This is right up his alley. He's like, he's great at sniffing out like corruption where it exists and really explaining how these ecosystems work, uh, the way he talks about the pharmaceutical companies. This, this is, you know, another form of that. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's extremely dangerous. Because it's just going to get worse and worse, right? As the as the chain analysis companies become become more enriched, and then they use those funds to further um, lobby and pass more regulation that enriches them more, and the 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 the, the result is uh, as that's happening is we're we're all losing you know losing our liberty, losing our ability to use these privacy tools as mm -hmm. as these people become enriched and more more powerful. It's Frankly, it's it's disgusting, right? And it's just it's just very difficult to to win that. So I think, but I think that that's an imp a very important meme to get out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tried getting Lola on on the show uh, numerous times. I don't know, maybe maybe you could uh, ed convince her to come on. I'll definitely chat with her. You may be a, a little bit too narrow. On. Yeah, maybe that was why I've tried for a long time, and then I see yeah. she went on what Bitcoin did. I was like, all right, she's you know. But, you know, I, I could be appropriate. I don't have to have to be a... Uh, Not a Monero evangelist every day. Yeah. <laughs> Just shut it down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> You've seen the show. Um, what else should we talk about here? I mean, those, those, those are the major points. Um, I had some other things. Let's see. Yeah, what do you think in terms of... Monero itself, right? So let's let's just go back towards the real world example here. Joe Schmo Monero user. How about that? So like you're just using Monero and then you send it back to Kraken. So anybody who's using Monero that that sends their Monero back to Kraken to go sell it for fiat, you're you're put on you're 
put on as this reads as this as this regulation currently reads yes. is you'd be put on on the list you'd yeah I, I don't even though obviously monero is not explicitly mentioned in the proposal i don't see a world in which it it isn't counted as this type of cvc mixer which is their their term for it so yeah i i would definitely expect that if this proposal goes through very quickly any usage of monero where you interact with the the regular economy is going to get you put on the list which is is terrifying obviously it's not what should be happening here but that's what i would expect i, I mean i expect the, the long-term result of that is that exchanges just don't list or delist monero entirely if they have any kind of u.s presence um, because the reporting requirements on this are absurd and, and make compliance costs go through the roof for these companies. The U.S. government argues that it doesn't, but this is a, a whole swath of new information. It requires new costs for chain analysis, contracts, that sort of thing. And it requires real-time reporting rather than just collecting information and providing it to the government on request. So it's a, it's a big change in reporting. So unfortunately, I wouldn't be surprised if that means... Monero just doesn't exist on regulated exchanges in the U.S. moving forward. Yeah, that's 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 obviously what I'm worried about here, right? Because it's like if every time somebody uses Monero, any Monero user that sends their Monero to a to an exchange, Kraken is the best example that they now have to file this report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's going to be hard for them to justify continuing to carry Monero, right? If that becomes with extra scum. Although with Monero, maybe it would be a little bit less uh, costly than other thing, right? Because it's just like, oh, he used Monero. Like, there's yeah, not they don't have to they... do any analysis. <laughs> no analysis there, right? Yeah. So there's arguments you made that it's, it's like true. almost, right? The cheapest almost... privacy tool that's compliant. <laughs> right. I don't know if it's going to work out that way, but am yeah. I silly in thinking that, right? Is yeah, that... I mean, it's actually kind of interesting because they don't need to pay a chain analysis contract or something like that to know if this person is using a privacy tool because they they necessarily are. I mean, the the other thing too is the the way that we incentivize companies to do this is, and I, I don't know, I, I always recommend avoiding KYC exchanges. That, that will continue. But one of the ways that we make it harder for governments to do this sort of proposal is that we we use these tools heavily. The more users there are, the more liquidity there is, the more financial flows of tools like privacy or like Monero through exchanges, the, the harder it is for these companies to kind of take the swallow the pill of the government and do what they want. And it also, it drives up reporting costs, which could be another good thing to uh, convince companies. This is absurd. We need to push back on this as well because we're having to spend too much money. So there's also something to be said about using these tools more actually makes it harder for the government to enforce these things. But I, I'm not going to tell you to use KYC exchanges more. That's, that can't be my uh, my takeaway here, but just kind of one of the things that, that could happen. Hmm. Yeah, I really, one of the things we skipped to, uh, another point is that chain analysis came out recently and and posted a blog actually saying wait a minute guys you're going even further than we wanted you to go in terms of the way the government was framing all this saying you're kind of misconstruing some of the da data i thought that was interesting that they they did so out. the timing is interesting though they actually did do it before the vincent proposal was live so oh, okay. i think it was actually in response to claims by like senator warren and yes. other mainstream media outlets that were saying like Hamas hundreds. is getting hundreds of millions of dollars in terrorist financing through cryptocurrency, which were just right. totally wrong. So I think that they're not pushing back on the FinCEN proposal. It came out the day before the proposal went live. Uh, but it's <laughs> it's very interesting, and I did cite it in the article as well, because they do have this whole blog post that says basically the way that we're attributing things to terrorist organizations is, is totally wrong, and we're way over-attributing their usage yeah. of cryptocurrency. I guess what, 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 why do you think they came out and did, I mean, I guess, cause they just, it's so blatant at that point, right? They need to, cause it doesn't it's, really necessarily help their. It right? does because it, it's, it, it's, it's an interesting angle and the, the marketing guy who wrote it, I, I don't know. It's fascinating, but essentially what it's saying is because you're not using our tools, you're over attributing things to terrorists. So it's right. not from the angle of terrorists are using less cryptocurrency than you think, even though that is the the takeaway for us, but it's the reason that you're misattributing this is because you're not using chain analysis tools and we can give you the right figures. Um, so it really is just a marketing blog to try to get people to use their tools rather than something else that these people are using or just making wild guesses. But um, 
yeah, that's, I think, their reasoning behind it is we can let you properly attribute things to terrorists. Yeah, and for anybody listening, what we're talking about here is is basically, yeah, like Senator Warren was out there saying, oh, uh, you know, Hamas is is using uh, cryptocurrency to basically um, launder hundreds, hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars worth worth of crypto. But what they were really looking at was the service providers that mm-hmm. the crypto was going through, where they knew some there was perhaps some small percentage, right? It could have even been like a thousand dollars worth of crypto, but these service providers were doing hundreds of millions of dollars in tra- in crypto transactions, yeah. and they were just stating all of the the total amount of crypto transactions going through these service providers. And the, there's two it, other really interesting things too. One of which is that. Hamas stopped using cryptocurrency at all for donations in April right. <laughs> because they said it was too dangerous for them. Well, they, they said donors. they stopped Bitcoin donations, right? Oh. So that, that's a, that's another thing, too. I don't know. You know, it wouldn't stray too far down that. that yeah. Trail. But, uh, <laughs> um, that is their their public opinion is that they actually don't accept cryptocurrency donations anymore since April. So that's a hilarious part of this anyways, if this is the justification, even though Hamas says that they don't use cryptocurrency. But then the other part is the the claim for and this is cited multiple times in the proposal for terrorists using cryptocurrency for financing is this case where four people were essentially funneling money to Hamas partially through cryptocurrency through Bitcoin specifically. Guess what the total amount that they sent through Bitcoin was? Yeah, so it was like two thousand dollars. Right? Twenty twenty thousand, but yeah, yeah. twenty thousand oh, okay, dollars is the 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 terrifying transmission of money to fund. Hamas is right. that that's the cited source. They don't have any other sources that they have in right. there. They constantly link this one prosecution where they caught four people for sending money to Hamas, $20,000 of which was through Bitcoin. It's like, I, I don't. It's, right. it's and so and all, the, all the other assets added up to like hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars when they were talking about the shell companies that they were using and things like that. Right. And then the so, yeah. aspect was like a very small amount. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know, man. But like I said, I mean, it's. I, I I think it's it's silly to to go along with their framing where we're even now debating. Oh, was you know, is it this much amount of crypto that was used for for potentially funding terrorism, or is it this amount? What percentage are are, are good people using crypto? What percentage are bad? Like we shouldn't even be engaging in that debate because at the end of the day, the fact is. At some point, a hundred percent of terrorist financing will be done through crypto in the future. I mean, it's going to ha- like crypto. Crypto is taking over. It's just a better. It's just a better tool for transacting for 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 money purposes, right? And so, it's going to grow in terms of all usage. And so, to kind of debate like the amount that they're using versus, I, I just think it's I just think it's a dangerous fight because. Uh, it's it's okay for Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin at the end of the day is traceable. It's, you know, uh, as used, right? Unless you, you do all these other things, but it's fundamentally transparent and it arguably does make it not the best tool to use for sending value through the internet where you want to be anonymous and, and private. Um, so there is reason there why it doesn't make sense for them to use this. But to like get get stuck in that argument and saying, all right, because of that, only a small amount of people are using it for for funding terrorism. I think it kind of backs us into a corner because eventually, the fact is, I think they are going to adopt these tools along with greater society adopting these tools because it's more efficient for them to do things. And because they want they want that privacy. They want it. They don't want they don't want everybody to be able to see into their bank account when they go online and they buy something. Um, so I don't know. Do you think I, I'm wrong there and thinking we should just skip over that whole debate? Like, it's like we're trying to hold the yeah. line here and being like, oh, it's only a small percentage. Yeah, no, I definitely see where you're coming from. And I think it's a it's a valuable thing to keep in mind that we don't just fit within their narrative. I think the the distinction I would make is that the primary goal should be helping people to understand how this stuff is freedom tech, how it does provide freedom to people today and in the future. That needs to be the primary goal. But I think that there is an important piece when things like this specifically are proposed to undermine their data that they're using to justify the claims. 
So I think like, yes, we should not, our primary narrative should not be terrorists don't use this tool. So you shouldn't be mad at us. I mean, that's, that's the Zcash narrative that they've made for years is like, Hey, 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 regulators, nobody uses Zcash. So you shouldn't worry about us. And it's, it's a, it's a dangerous slope. So I definitely don't think that should be the primary one, but when the specific proposal is saying primarily bad people use these tools, I think there is something powerful in explaining to people, look at the data, they're wrong. So that they can, un we can undermine specific claims, but focus the narrative on these tools provide human freedom. And so I think I think you're right, and I think keeping it on the broader framing of the good things that these tools enable is yeah. the most important. But I do think in these specific cases, we should undermine the the claims that they make, and then point people towards the good that these things do. Because I always see it followed up by Bitcoin or saying, oh, yeah, and actually Bitcoin is transparent and it's traceable. So it'd be <laughs> silly for them to use it. Even if they are and they don't yet realize, that's where I think it gets dangerous, right? Because then we're saying we're saying these tools are OK because they're fundamentally traceable. And we're, you know, we're admitting that, like, all right, this is this is why it's OK to use them. But then when it's realized, all right, but there's other ways to use them where they're not traceable are we then okay with that like yeah and that's that, i mean that's people who use that as an excuse for why bitcoin should be allowed and should be fine uh, to regulators etc are usually people who are going to go along with the gilded cage system and just say yeah i'll just keep using it in the compliant manner i don't need these privacy tools so yeah i think that's it's definitely a dangerous slippery slope um but yeah yeah i don't know i think you said it well so how do you see this ultimately playing out, man? I mean, uh, th this is just a proposal here. The regulations haven't passed. Do you think, I mean, obviously this this is hard, hard to say, but do you think that it's actually going to pass as is? Or will there be some watered down version? And even if it doesn't pass as is, do we, do, do we continue to move in this direction where the government clamps further and further down and categorizes things like Monero as, as being essentially being mixers and puts us on a list and further pushes you know pushes us towards this bifurcated system where there you know there there's there's clean coins <laughs> and dirty you know uh black black market coins is that is that the road we're headed headed down i mean what do, what do you think yeah i mean i think i think realistically this or something close to it will pass i i I think that that's that's where we're at the government has enough control and enough sway to to get something like this through um, unfortunately, I, I'm not, now I'm not an expert at all in this area. I just, I'm passionate about privacy. So I think that's important to keep up with what the government is doing to try and oppress privacy tools, privacy tech. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if this passes at least similar to how it's written now. Um, but the, the silver lining and the beautiful part of this is that the whole reason that tools like Monero exist is so that we don't have to rely on governments to tell us what we can and cannot do. Like the whole point of it is to be able to, to opt out of government money and of government control and be able to do what we want with our finances. Uh, and so like, I think the, the optimistic view is Monero will continue to work. It will continue to exist. The, the only thing that might get more difficult is buying Monero initially because it, it might be delisted or be harder to buy on exchanges or cost more because of compliance costs. Who knows exactly how it'll play out. But that's why we need tools that allow us to onboard and offboard people into Monero without having to rely on regulated entities. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of power in the things that are being built out. Uh, and I think that there is a symbiotic relationship that we have to understand between Monero and Bitcoin. And this type of proposal should make that only clear for people is that we need ways to be able to easily go between Bitcoin and Monero that are not able to be stopped by the government. Because it's it's a lot, the government is much less likely to completely ban Bitcoin usage and completely ban Bitcoin purchasing, et cetera, than it is to do Monero. So if people can get Bitcoin, and then they can get Monero with their Bitcoin. That is the on-ramp I think we really need to focus on outside of the the normal fiat one, but that's really going to be like peer-to-peer -peer exchanges moving forward, I think. So I, I would hope that more in the Monero community wake up to the, the realization that Bitcoin is a powerful tool for Monero users and for the Monero community, and that it can be one of, if not the biggest, on-ramp into Monero uh, over the coming years. Yeah, they're, they're not banning Bitcoin. That, no. That's not happening. No. Uh, but do you think this moves us closer towards them potentially banning Monero? 
Yes. Or at least making it so that there's no kind of white market economy uses for it. Yeah. I mean, I think that will be the result of the proposal most likely is that Monero won't be available in the U.S. on any regulated exchange, which essentially means that less merchants will list it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I think that that is the one of the stepping stones. Will they ever overtly say Monero is banned? I don't know, because that, that opens them up to a lot of risk. But doing things like this that just choke out the on and off ramps is the easiest thing for them. So that's why I think building out better on and off ramps, things like Havano, things like uh, Sarai, things that allow us to get into and out of Monero easily and without having to give over all of our uh, personal information to to the government are, are key. Because um, Monero is going to continue working as a chain. It's going to continue providing privacy. It's going to continue getting better as people build out amazing things like Seraphis for it. So we just need to continue to make sure that there are ways that people can get, get into and out of Monero as necessary. And hopefully getting more and more merchants to accept it directly because that's the choke point that's hardest for them to control is merchant adoption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's where I'm like really focused now. We're trying to build out XMR Bazaar. I don't know if you heard of that one. No, um, not yet. Yeah, so it's uh, like like a Monero, like Monero Market. I don't know if you've seen Monero Market. So a peer-to-peer peer, peer -peer marketplace. Mm -hmm. People can buy and sell goods and services for Monero. Nice. But we're building in uh, like a trustless escrow. Nice. Um, so exciting i think that that's the direction we need to go right we, we need mm -hmm. to build out our own circular economy yeah. and that we, we don't care anymore uh even even if you don't have monero maybe that becomes the way you earn it right you go on and you offer you offer your services for monero you know you could do whatever uh graphic design get paid in monero and that, that's that's how you're onboarded right yep. um that that's definitely the the way to go and the direction the direction they're actually pushing us towards, which is kind of ironic because it's mm -hmm. the direction we do Peter want. Peer as it always should have been. It's the direction we want to head in. Um, but this, this is a difficult question, though. I mean, do you think there's any ethical dilemma, though, in pushing people in this direction? I'm out there doing it all the time, right? This, this, is, this is the world I want to live in. I want to create a parallel economy where we can trade peer to peer without censorship, without surveillance, we could use our digital cash. But is it irresponsible to kind of tell people to move in this direction when, you know, if there were to ever be a ban or something like, are we, you know, cause I'm sure people, let, let's be honest here, right? Like I, I'm fearless about it, right? I'm, I'm in, you know, I, I ran, I ran for Congress on the platform, but you know, a, average Joe that's sitting on the fence there, maybe they're a Bitcoiner, they're considering Monero, but they're a little worried that if they start to, to get into this Monero thing, a ban may come down and here they are, they're stuck with their Monero and in their mind, it's like, well, now what do I do with it? It's been made illegal. How do you talk about that and reframe that to people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think ultimately, as long as that's optional, I, I don't think that that's a concern. I mean, there's a reason why we don't want governments forcing specific things on merchants, exchanges, etc. cetera. We, we want this to be a, a free market economy. So if there's enough incentive for merchants to accept Monero or for people to provide goods and services for Monero, let them do it and push for it. I mean, it's it's good. It's also a, a self-reinforcing thing in that we can, if we can build up enough of a circular economy, it doesn't really matter if it's illegal or legal because we can just exist as a shadow economy, which shadow or black market economy is uh, in many places bigger than the the white market above board economy. And it's something that has, has always existed, will always exist. So I, I don't see any ethical dilemma in it. I mean, if Obviously, if people want to know more about what happens in the future, if this gets banned, we, we're open and honest with them. I, I think we certainly shouldn't hide that there may be government action against Monero at some point, but that shouldn't scare people away. And yet again, that's why it's very, very important that we have ways to get into and out of Monero. Because if you onboard a merchant to Monero, they accept Monero for a long time. And then if the government says Monero is illegal, you can't accept it, and they want to get out, they need to have ways to do that. I think it would be an ethical dilemma if there was no way to get out of Monero and they were just right. stuck with it. But that's where the tools that we're pouring money into as a Monero community to build come in handy because they'll be able to say like, okay, then I'll just, I'll, I'll trade it all for Bitcoin and I'll move on. That's fine. I, I don't really see any issues with that. Um, and I, I think as long as it's optional, it's a, it's a good thing. It's very cypherpunk to onboard people to something that's optional, let them make the decision and then help them along the way. Awesome, man. Seth, thank you so much.
thanks for having me. This was a, a blast and a great chance to get to talk through something that can be very doom and gloom, but hopefully there were some uh, some optimistic takeaways and, and thoughts throughout because I, I really do think it shows that we're winning and it shows that the tools that have been built out and are being built out are working and these things will continue to work with or without government approval. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely in the, they'll fight you next. They'll fight you phase, right? Oh, we're, we're in the, we're in the fighting phase. So now is not the time to give up. Now's the time to double down. Oh yeah. Um, use your Monero, sp mm -hmm. spread the good word on, on, on what the utility is and why it's important. Absolutely. And we just, we just gotta, we just gotta win. We gotta win. We gotta win on, uh, we gotta win over, we gotta win over the normies too. I, you know, it's, uh, I'm all about the, the opting out, but we, we really do need to spread the meme. People need to understand that we're, we're right. We're on the right side of history here. And those that are looking to destroy and ban these, these, these freedom tech tools, they're on the, they're on the wrong side of history. Absolutely. All right, buddy, anything else you want to put out there? Any other information? No, I think that's about it. Um, yeah, the the blog post that a lot of this is drawing from will be live once this go li goes live. So go to freedom.tech to to read it or, or look in the show notes. Um, but really excited for, for what freedom.tech will mean moving forward. If anybody listening has something they want to contribute, reach out. I'd love to, to help you get it published and uh, help you on that, that journey to, to contributing and getting, getting the word out there on how important Monero is or just broadly Freedom Tech is. So yeah, thankful for that. Thanks for having me on, Doug. Always a blast to get to chat with you. Yeah, always, man. All right, Seth. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.